There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world, I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with the one and only Roger Drummer. Roger, what is up, my brother? Oh, it's a very fine day. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. So Roger is a veteran of the podcast scene. He's actually been doing this a long time, but kind of shut it down for a while because he had a personal crisis in his life. And he's gracing the Jay Campbell podcast with his presence today. And you guys will know what I mean by the time of the end of the show. But for you, for those of you who don't not, are not familiar with him, he is an herbalist writer and formulator of Tan Chi for stress, brain function, immunity, and sleep. And his huge claim to fame, which according to me, is that he cured his stage three bladder cancer using bliss, herbs, and the ketogenic diet. And we're going to get into all that here today. But Roger, as I've been prone to do on the Jay Campbell podcast, uh, really in the last year, since the world went uh, cuckoo for cocoa, uh, Today is, by the way, for the, those watching, Thursday, September 28, 2023. I think the show will run some point in the next couple of months. But um, just your version of where we're headed as a species. Are you a, are you long humanity <laughs> or are you short? <laughs> well, I, I think that everything is proceeding exactly the way it's supposed to and that, um, you, I don't want to fall into the trap because I've been on a spiritual journey for 30 years to assume that everybody is. Right. Well, everybody is. They just don't realize it. That's true. Uh, everybody has the same amount of light inside them. Certain amount of people manifest different levels of it. But um, I don't like to fall into the trap of thinking that because I'm becoming more conscious that everybody is. Right. Or it's just like when I became a vegetarian years ago and, and I'm not anymore, but when I was on a vegetarian diet, I thought everybody was a vegetarian because you only hung out with vegetarians. That's right. <laughs> right. Like tracks life. Yeah. You yeah. know, but I do think it, it's, there's a lot of movement in the consciousness world and it is growing and it, it's just how everything evolves in life. Yeah. That's right. Well, let me read this to you because it's a perfect timing for this amazing podcast that you and I are about to have. And I've already manifested this, but I found this in one of my readings last night, and it's perfect. For, it's perfectly apropos to read this. So, when we have learned our lessons and have aligned ourselves with one or another of the two fundamental universal principles, creation or entropy, we are permitted to lead by one of two doors, either up or down, the ascending or descending path. The choice is ours. That is the great cosmic economy and the great secret of the world. Truth comes from knowledge. Knowledge leads to love. To achieve love in the higher realms, one must hold that love here in the lower realm, but not that love that seeks to overcome or ignore or shut out the truth of the nature or the world within which we live. The objectivity of nature as it is viewed with love by the Logos unconditionally. So that is uh, from a very profound work, which I won't get involved in today, but it's perfectly apropos to what you were saying, because bottom line is each of us as you said, has a max, a massive number amount of light in our souls through our spirit. But some of us, you know, are not yet there to the place of where we can actually show it and actually allow more of it to come in. As you said, a, a like attracts like, but as you also said, we are all walking the same path. And I like to say the path is back to perfection. The great Walter Russell said, um, we all come out at the base of the jungle and the path is back to the top of the mountain. And how many quote unquote lifetimes and lessons are served to us to get there, you know, is up to the individual and soul user, right? So it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny to think about 
what you said is exactly right. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter really what your viewpoint is because divi the divine statement, which you said, and I a hundred percent agree to is that everything is happening divinely as it's intended always and in all ways. Yeah. And all resistance is futile. And all, and the key to everything is love. That's right. It's, even if you're just looking at how your energy body works, it's the key is right in the center is love. The, the, the condition of your heart chakra is what allows all energy to come into your body anyway. That's so, right. right. Beautiful, man. All right. So let's talk about your situation, your story. Um, the first talking point is bliss and the five bodies of the soul. But before we even get into that, can you just tell us your story for those sure. that don't know it about curing cancer? Well, I was, I was having one of these days. Actually, it was a week. I was just feeling extremely tired. And I was going to do a, a, a phone call that I had scheduled for every Thursday night. And I was so tired, I went out and got a 14-ounce cup of coffee, which I never drank at that time. And I drank that and still didn't feel anything. And I did my hour-long talk on the phone and my little lecture. And then I went to the bathroom and just urinated pure red blood. And clots were shooting out like a BB gun. And it was just, and I almost passed out, not because it hurt, because it would just freak me out. Yeah, yeah. Shot. Yeah. And then but I decided not to go to the emergency room because I had a friend who ran the urgent care. And I knew I could see him at eight o'clock in the morning and he would actually give me real information as opposed to just going to the emergency room for eight hours. It's amazing, by the way, Roger, that most people don't know that. In fact, if, if you were educated to the to the system, you know, and I don't want to rabbit hole because I want you to tell your story, but most people would actually never go to any of those places. Yeah. And so my friend was there and I trusted him. And so by that time, though, I had been up the entire night because I was passing clots and I didn't know the nature of it. So sure. I, in my mind, I thought, just keep drinking water because you don't want the clots to get stuck. Right. And so I was up every 20 minutes going to the bathroom and shooting clots and peeing red blood. So were you actually, were you defecating blood too, or it's just urine? No, no, just urine. And I went to urgent care. They ran all the tests. They couldn't do a, a test on my urine because there's too much blood in it. Sent sure. me to the hospital uh, under his directions, got a um, PET scan done. This was now three o'clock in the afternoon. And I had been urinating blood for almost 21 hours and feel really tired because I hadn't slept and weak because I was eating so much. Sure. And the guy came out and he couldn't share my results with me. And I asked him, it was late. It was Memorial day weekend. Right. And uh, it was now Friday. And I, I asked him, you know, what the results were. And he, they can't tell you. They just said, you have to see a urologist right away. I said, well, make me an appointment. I'll go tomorrow. He goes, Oh, you won't be able to see anybody till Tuesday because they're all out of the office for Memorial Day. Right. I said, but I've been bleeding for almost 24 hours. She goes, well, you probably won't bleed out by Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It was one of the all-time classic lines I have story of all time, literally. Yeah, because it, I mean, it's funny. Yeah, for the people. We wanted to hit him and halfway just smiled because it was so stupid. But look, you know, there, there's a story to unpack there, you know, for people. And again, I have a very sophisticated audience, but the reality is, is that most people do deal with that same kind of nonsense, Roger, yeah. because the, and, and you know, and this isn't even a fault of this guy. We're not judging or condemning that guy, but they really are working in a system that's triaged in sick care. There's no wellness or optimization or health here. It's literally who is the worst of the lot that we absolutely have to see. And so in that guy's mind, in, in that system, which is absolutely broken, as you know, you wouldn't die by Tuesday. Think yeah. about that. Yeah. And so he gave me a uh, Cipro, right? And normally I would never take Cipro, but you know, I've been urinating blood yeah, for, yeah. <laughs> for a day. And so I took it and it stopped within about six hours. So then I got this false feeling. Well, gosh, it's over. Maybe it was the infection, you know, but I, I kept my appointment. And of course, I'm sitting in the office and the doctor comes out and he tells me I had stage three bladder cancer. And he starts to tell me that he's going to remove my bladder and my prostate 
and make a new bladder out of my intel. Oh my God. It takes about 14 hours of surgery. He goes, but it works really well. You'll live to be 90 and you'll, uh, and you know, and that's the only treatment they actually have for it. And it, the whole time he was telling me, I have this very active um, higher intuition, which speaks to me just like you, just like your voice, right? Yeah. I hear this voice. And the voice says, um, you have a hole in your aura and you have to fix the hole in your aura. And I knew exactly what it was with my second chakra, which is, it has to do with bladder. And it has to do with putting yourself out in the world. And, you know, being heavily introverted, I understood it completely. <laughs> and so he, uh, and then while he's talking to me, the, my intuition tells me I have to get blissed out, fix the hole in my aura. Because in the, if you look at all the writings on the five bodies of the soul, which we'll right. get into, when you can transcend your mental, emotional body, you reach a point where your soul will fix your DNA and everything will go back to that's the right. than it was before. That's, all, that's so amazing. That's, he's telling me, at the same time, I'm hearing him say he's going to remove all my organs. Right. The voice is telling me, get blissed out and you'll cure your cancer. So I want to add to that. Um, and again, this is just the universe is just po perfectly coinciding. As you know, there are no coincidences, just synchronicities. But Roger, I'm just like you, man. Like I tell people this all the time. And, you know, people know me as a biohacking master, blah, blah, blah. But like I every time they come at me and they say, I've got this physical malady, this dis-ease, this disorder, this dysregulation, I always say to them this. I mean, I literally, this is my message every single time. And th this is just from last night. They say, Jay, but the health issues on the surface look like thyroid when in actuality the problems of toxicity and toxins affecting hypothalamus, pituitary, that. And this is what I say. Listen to me very closely. And by the way, this is an influencer that has like 250,000 people to follow him. I said, we are not really physical bodies, but vibrating particles and oscillating waves of pure energy, pure spiritual energy. When Rin rises to this level of awareness, he or she also realizes that any illness and disease stem from spiritual amputation, a.k.a. unintegrated trauma or a broken energy field. This can originate in this current lifetime or the likely many previous ones you've experienced. Loving and trusting yourself is the first step to treating illness and any disease. So I literally say that over and over again, again, to people that have no awareness levels that you and I have. And so, I mean, I'm sure people think that I'm nuts, right? But I constantly put that on social media or versions of it. So I know where you're going with this. And again, it's very simple. We aren't physical bodies. Yes, we have physical bodies. Our spirit ambulates in these physical bodies. But when we get to the awareness that we can cure anything through harnessing and improving and integrating whatever it is that spiritually amputates us, which you had a hole in your aura, I've had, we've all have holes in our aura, right? Yeah, we all are disconnected. <laughs> exactly. Some part. Some part. But, but it's like once you get there, how much easier is it for somebody to actually, quote unquote, then learn what is necessary to heal it? But the problem is that most people are so in resistance to getting there that they can't and they go down the path of chemotherapy and all the other shit that they were going to do to you. Yeah, you know, but a, a lot of that is due to the fact that they don't understand. But also there's a tremendous amount of fear that comes in. Yeah. And you find out fear, you man. When I left the doctor's office, even though my higher intuition was giving me this unbelievable download of information, I still felt like I was on drugs. It was almost like you're now walking on the bottom of a swimming pool in eight foot of water trying to walk. It is just everything sluggish. The whole world just slows down to this sluggish feeling that you can barely move. And it, did you, did you think though, in your mind's eye, you know, cause obviously you're having your higher self talk to you and yeah, maybe you're in a little bit of resistance to it, but did you, did you truly think Roger that you were going to die at any moment? I mean, at any point of that, in that initial, well, at, at, I thought that there was a possibility I could die because I had a very, you know, bladder cancer. Yeah, of it course. goes to stage four and leaves the bladder. You're done. Um, you know, stage three is where it's left the bladder. It's in the fatty layer. Right. And if it right. leaves that, hardly anybody survives. Right. By the way, way, my mom, it. just so you know, my grandmother, my dad has bladder cancer now, but it's like really early, like stage one. He's 80. You should probably talk to him, but he's so unaware, dude. He won't listen to anything you say. Yeah, they have treatment for that. It's real simple. No, I know. I know. I know. But 
I, I mean, I always tell him, I'm like, hey, dad, what if you actually just wore, I mean, yeah, it's a whole other conversation. I don't want to rabbit it all. But, uh, but my, his, his mom, my grandmother died of, of bladder cancer. So, right. So like that, that's why the, the medical, the allopathic community loves to tell people, oh, this is in your DNA. It runs in your family. You have a family history of it. <laughs> no. They do though. They do tell them that. You know, I, I had an interesting urologist who was my doctor for this, and I love the guy. He he just said, you know, with your lifestyle, you probably developed this back when you were 18, when you were a farmer, because I was exposed to a lot of pesticides, right. Right. stuff like that. And he goes, but you live so healthy after you turned 25 that it was so slow, it finally showed up. <laughs> Dude, that sounds like the guy was amazing to even yeah. say that. Yeah, you know, he had had cancer before, so he never pressed you to do anything. He just gave you what he could do for you. That's awesome. And he was, what fact, when he calls me the miracle man now, I used to go see him once every year for five years, and he would tell everybody in the office I was a miracle man, and he'd give them my website for herbs. And, and, he, and one day I said, well, you, would you like to know all the things that I did? He goes, no, actually, I can't do anything with it. Because I'd have to change my entire practice. I'd have to I'd have to do all these things and I can't even suggest herbs to somebody because then if it doesn't work for them, I get sued. They'll fire me exactly. That's what, the system, that's what the system's set up to be. He goes, but by the way, he goes, I know exactly what you did anyway, because I have a friend who's an anesthesiologist who's a uh um practices functional medicine too on the side. And he works with I didn't know it, but he worked with that doctor and he oh, shared wow. all the emails I gave to him. So he had my whole program. <laughs> and so I didn't do anything with, it. Anything with it. He had the whole program. So unreal. That's awesome. I, I left the doctor's office and was driving. I didn't go 200 yards and a guy made a bad turn and hit my car. Jesus. So now I'm in a parking lot working out. I have very little damage. I had a little dent about the size of a silver dollar on my one fender. Sure. His car had a bunch of damage to the front of it. And it was such an amazing experience because we got in the parking lot. He was elderly. He was probably in his mid seventies and he was freaking out. I thought the guy was going to have a heart attack because he was driving his wife's car and he wrecked it and she loved her car. Right. So now I'm in the parking lot. I I'm feeling like death when I get in the parking lot and all of a sudden I move right into my higher soul where I'm teaching him breathing exercise a lot, teaching him how to talk to his wife, all these different things to do. We exchange information and I send him home and, and I realized, wow, I just got popped into my higher self by helping somebody else. That's amazing. Yeah. And then I went home after that and, and I have to admit, I fell into a funk for a couple of weeks where I didn't know what to do. And, and basically, that's a that's a symptom of stress. It shuts off the frontal lobe. Sure. Okay. And then I realized, I actually started laughing in my living room because I realized I make stress supplements. That's right. <laughs> that's awesome. Man. All the supplements I needed were sitting in my kitchen. So I went and took him. My brain turned on, and I started formulating a plan. It's amazing, and that and that's honestly how it works. I mean, even with the 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 old man in the parking lot, you know, the higher mind will enter. You know, like they say in the in the teachings of initiates, you know, the, the master appears when the student is ready. And that guy needed your help. And literally your higher mind took over and you coached him, even though you're faced with a you know, life, you know, it's essentially a, a death sentence or a potentially life altering sentence. That's what happens. I've actually been there many times in my life, too. It's funny that you say that because I've been in also a couple of car accidents. Dude, one time I was literally driving or riding a bike and somebody hit me. And I was more concerned with the woman's car than me. <laughs> so you, you don't even know why. I mean, like there were, cause there were, and the only reason I know that is that there were people that had come up on the side of the road to like say, Hey, I watched the whole thing. She hit you. Are you okay? You know, I'm, I'm here to testament for you. And then, they, and then they would watch me go on and on and on about like making sure a car was okay. And I was obviously young and virile and full of energy, but, uh, and I was fine, but uh, they were like, bro, you need to like chill out. Like she hit you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my the very first time my higher intuition spoke to me about something that was more than just information used to just tell me who was going to win boxing matches who was going to do 
you know, when it first happened, I was just sitting there watching a boxing match, and this voice says, so and so's gonna win by knockout at the one minute mark of the fourth round. I go, What the hell is that? I'm looking around the room, right? And what happens? Fourth round, one minute in, boom, guys down. Yeah. So when I got I got hit by a truck riding my bike on a training ride in Hawaii, in Maui. And uh as I'm laying there and they got me in a full body suit to load me up into the ambulance because they didn't know if I broke my spine and all these different things. And this voice just said, You are not your body. And that That's was, awesome. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you are not your body. And it just like, wow, what is that? And that really was, was the start of my spiritual life was after that. I knew I had to move to LA I, and I was going to study Shiatsu and it was just spiritual spirit experience after spiritual. How experience. old were you when that happened, by the way? I was 30, about 34, something like that, 35. And at that point, and I always ask these questions because I find them fascinating. But at that point, were you spiritual at all? Very little. I had gone to a couple of, you remember when Ramtha was going oh, around? Yeah. There was somebody that came that was right after Ramtha. And uh, some friends, yeah, some friends of mine brought me a ticket. So I attended a weekend seminar. And it was pretty mind-blowing. But I didn't know what to make of it. I had just started reading some New Age books. That's real, man. Yes, I didn't have anything. But I, I had some experiences there that were. It actually might have been Ramtha that said that to you. Yeah, who, who knows? But, you know, I. Wow, that's amazing. I was, you know, we're, I'm in this room with hundreds of people. And I'm kissing a stranger's feet and, and doing all these things you're telling me. And I'm just getting popped into space. Wild. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing, man. That is an amazing story. And I didn't have a practice, had no spiritual practice. I didn't meditate. I, you know, being heavily introverted, I was just always in my. Sure. But what year, do you remember what year? I mean, because now I'm fascinated. What year was that? Do you remember the actual year? That would have been about, that I was going to that seminar about 1986. Damn. And then I'll- Dude, this is insane. My head is like exploding right now. So all, all the books of Barbara Garciniak, the first book, which was Family of Light, was 1986. Wow. Holy shit, dude. Yeah. Mind blowing. I was gonna say, was it in the was it in the late eighties before you said the year? And now, like, that's the, literally that year. So, what I'm saying or getting at is that that was the time that this planet literally started to wake up. Like, you're a, you're considered, you know, Dolores Cannon would call you first a first waiver, and I'm a second waiver. But like the people that were like being turned on, tuned in, turned on, you were being turned on, you know, attuned. You were a you, how do they say it? You were attuned to be tuned. Uh, that that's when it started happening here. So I would say that like these, you know, call them call them higher dimensional consciousness, like Ramtha and others, you know, just started showing up. Right, and you know, it, it's kind of funny because right after that accident, I had moved to LA. I went and started to apprentice at an herb shop, and instantly started having spiritual experiences. I think a lot of it had to do with. Even though I didn't have a spiritual practice, I did read a little bit, but I was attracted to certain things and I was just discovering Rumi poetry and all of a sudden, but I had been eating a ve- a very strict vegetarian diet, yeah. which is very cleansing to your energy body. Sure. It's not something I would recommend long-term as you get older because yeah, you yeah. need other nutrients, but yeah. as far as cleansing your energy body, it does open you up. Yeah, And I think when I sat down and had my first herbs I was taking, that's why with the very first Chinese herbs I took, I had flying dreams. And then they turned into crying dreams every night. And then I drank this tea and had a seven-day altered experience. And all it was was a tea that 10 other people drank and nobody felt a single thing from it. Well, what, what was the experience like from an altered standpoint? I mean, like, did you see, did you, did you technically hallucinate or no? No, not at all. But what what it is is my this is my first momentary bliss experience. I drank this tea. I served it for a bunch of people. I wasn't even invited to the event at the herb shop. I was the lowly guy that did all the dishes and stuff and cooked things at the shop because I didn't know anything. Sure. And so I drank a couple cups. Walking home, I was probably a quarter of a mile away from the shop, and literally God spoke. Man. And it freaked me out. It was just this loud voice that told me everything 
was perfect and you're perfectly fine. And literally, you're going to laugh because um, I thought I was, someone was playing a trick on me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So loud, the voice, that I started looking around parked cars and looking to see if my somebody from the herb shop followed me home and was doing it, playing a joke on me. Didn't happen. I walked another 20 yards or so, and the voice spoke to me again and said I was perfectly fine, and I'm right where I needed to be at that moment. Amazing. At that moment, all my hair stood up, my yeah. goosebumps everywhere. And I went home, and I walked into this room where I was, I was renting a bedroom in a house. They had no furniture in it, just a mattress. And I sat down and looked at the white wall and didn't move for probably four hours. I don't remember even having a thought. I was just gone. Blissed out. The wall. Went to sleep. Went to my shiatsu class the next day. Didn't know what to make of it. Went to my shiatsu class the next morning. And everybody at the class came up to me and go, did you do something different this week? You look completely different. And I'm thinking, oh, I know I haven't done anything. I didn't think anything. I had my class, went home, walked into a grocery store to get a pack of gum, right? About the only thing I would ever go into a grocery store for was a pack of gum, right? <laughs> I, ate, I shopped at health food stores. They ate all organic food. Right. Right? But I just wanted a pack of gum, right? And so I walked in, and all of a sudden, it this bright light, just came on and all and it felt like every light in the store was 10 times brighter than it was when i walked in wow and i had this thought wow look at all this food this is just an amazing place people have access to all these things <laughs> and the boy said roger what the hell's wrong with you <laughs> this is the grocery store and i thought what was that right and I started having these dialogues, and the and the dialogue was laughing at me because I thought everything was so amazing. Right? And then I walked up to the to get into the line for the cashier to pay her, and there's this woman working the cashier who was about as round as she was tall. She was from Guatemala, didn't speak much language. She's very short, you know. And I had this experience where I felt her in my heart. I felt this was the first time it ever happened to me. I felt someone's essence. Wow. And if you if you ever feel a woman's essence, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever feel in your entire life. Yeah. Because they're really women are more heart chakra centered than oh, men. Yeah. Oh, and well, she's from Guatemala. That whole Central America Latin culture is all heart centered anyway. Yes. Yes. And at that moment, I th- I felt that she was probably the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my entire life. And, you know, I'm standing there and all of a sudden I hear this voice saying, hurry up. What's this stupid guy doing? Why is he taking so long? And what's this idiot doing? And I, and I thought there were voices. And it was no, I was reading everybody's mind that was standing behind me. I believe that. Yeah. And there was not a word being spoken by anyone, but I could tell all their thoughts and they all thought I was stupid. And I was taking up too much time and I was preventing them from getting back out to their car. Right. So I paid for my gum and I'm walking out thinking, God, that is the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my entire life. I never said much of a word to her. I just paid for my gum. But I was just all this heart chakra stuff. And then I walked out the door and it just so happened I had had a shirt on, a t shirt on that was popular at the time. It had this wavy colored flag on it, but it had the word peace in 17 different languages, all the front. So I walk out of the door and I notice the sun shining. It's a clear day. And all of a sudden this guy screams at me, he screams at me. He goes, what the hell do you mean? And he was screaming about my shirt, peace. There's no peace. He starts screaming at me about um, the Soviet Union. Now the Soviet Union, he's got this stack of literature, and they're all rolled up. He starts screaming at me. He's hit me in the chest with it, right? So you're in what? Where are you right now? In West LA, right? I was in Venice Beach, <laughs> Venice Beach, along along uh, Lincoln Boulevard, which is one of the most polluted, stinky roads in the whole. Area. Especially now, right now. Yeah. So I'm standing, and the guy's hitting me, and he's screaming at me about the Soviet Union's going to take over the United States, and they're plotting our destruction. And, and 
Gorbachev is doing this, and Gorbachev is doing that, and oh we're all going to die. And he's hitting me with this rolled up thing. And I just look at him and I'm smiling. And this little voice is, you know, telling me, this is interesting. And I, that's what I thought, right? So, and he goes, and then what do you think of it? Finally, he says, what do you think? And I looked at him and, I, and this thought came to me and I said, well, everything you say is probably true. But there's an entire another section of the world that has a different consciousness and that consciousness is going to meet that consciousness and it's all just going to meet and neutralize everything and nothing will happen and right when i said it the voice said roger that's some of the best new age crap i've heard in a long time <laughs> and i started laughing one of the guys he goes what do you mean that's such bullshit he says to me and he just starts and while he's yelling at me again, I start noticing that the clouds are all moving and I'm starting to see colors and I see colors around me and I feel my heart just getting huge. And I'm standing there and he's yelling at me and I'm just, now he's in my energy field. And, I, and I've and i never seen energy fields before. Yeah. And now I see my heart is just surrounded this guy. And he's yelling at me and yelling at him and all of a sudden he just gets real slow. He goes... I really just want to go home. I said, really? He goes, yeah, my son, I have a six-year-old son in San Diego. That's where I live. And, and I really miss him right now. For some reason right now, I just really miss him. I want to see my son. I said, well, why don't you just go home? And he goes, well, he goes, I think I will. Thank you. God, I'm so glad I met you. He handed me all his literature. He ran and got on the RTD bus and disappeared. Wow. And I and then right at that time I was so high I could feel the air going in my cell. I literally could feel all my cells breathing and the oxygen going in. And I'm walking out the parking lot. I dumped all his literature in the trash, and I'm starting to go down Lincoln Boulevard. I have to walk about 50 yards to get to my street. And I mean the pollution there is just unbelievable. But I could feel the air tasted the sweetest air I've ever tasted in my life and I when I breathed I could feel it go in the mole into my cells and all my mile it's just I could feel everything and I turned down my street and I only had about 150 yards to walk but I think it took me about a half an hour because every plant and every tree and bush that had a flower I stopped and experienced it it was live and it was like everything was live and and I was just went home I finally got home and I sat and I stared at the wall again for about six hours and never had a thought and nothing ever happened. Wow. And then the next seven days, um, any little thing could pop me right back into the space. I wasn't in it all the time, but if someone like touched my arm or asked me a question or said something from their own heart, I would just get popped back into bliss in this blissful state. Wow. And then I tried to explain it to my herb teacher because I'm in an herb shop where they talked about Shen spirit all the time. It was one of their big things. The three treasures of life force, Jing, and, and spirit, right? And so I was explaining it to them, and I realized my higher intuition told me that none of them had ever experienced Shen or real spirit. They just talked about it, well, which is the way almost everything in life is, right? Of course. They talked about it, and that... I had to stay at the herb shop to find out what happened to me because no one there was going to teach me. I had to find it out on my own. And that's how I became an herbalist from that experience. Amazing. I mean, that, but you're right. I mean, that is kind of how the way it is. It's like, again, the teacher will appear when the student is ready. I mean, things just happen, you know, organically. The, the more, the more you attempt to plan, and I, and this took me a long time in my life, you know, where it's like, it's got to be this bullet point. It's got to be this bullet point. It's got to be this bullet point, Roger. The less you ever will get it. Because again, at least in my opinion, in this dimension, this is a school for souls. You know what I mean? Like we're literally here to evolve and to grow. And, and there is no right or wrong way of evolution, right? Like whatever happens to you, if you look at it from a perspective of, you know what? I can learn from this, right? Because I mean, I always say, I want more of this and I want less of that. Right. But even, even if it's not something that quote unquote, you label as positive, what initially happens. Right. I mean, obviously you were diagnosed with potentially 
third, you know, stage three bladder cancer and, you know, they can freak you out and tell you die and you're bleeding and all that stuff. So you could have a focus or a mindset of like, oh my God, this is horrible. And you naturally will go through a little bit of that, right? Because you shot and fall. But then eventually you'll get to a point. And again, this is kind of the separation of humanity where it's like, that was the greatest opportunity for you. And I always say to people, the most contrast produces the greatest growth from entropy comes creation, right? So it's like, if we just look at things as everything that, as you said earlier, at the very beginning of the show is happening as it's divinely intended, then there's an opportunity for growth and evolution from every single thing that happens to us. So, so my, the reason I tell you my backstory, because it played such a role in me accepting the fact that I was going to get blissed out anyway. Right. 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 I, I, the 14 years I spent in Venice Beach was really about studying esoteric Chinese herbology, um, every energetic work I could. I got initiated in everything from Sufism to Buddhism to different white tantra, thing, everything you could imagine. I did, I was belonged to a temple and did Kundalini yoga every day for hours and all these different energy exercises. And so I had experienced bliss four or five times, sometimes for 30 days at a time where I was almost non-functional. Wow. Just out of it. And so always had to come back because I had a, I had a life going on at the same time. I had to work. And so, and so when I got my cancer diagnosis, I understood what bliss was and what I had to do. The only thing that worried me about it was I didn't have access to all the specialty herbs that I had done before. Yeah. uh, To help me get into that state. But it's just like working out at the gym. You have this basis of remembrance that your whole body has of it, just like your body remembers your you have muscle memory of everything. Yep. You know, my spiritual body was easy to prime. And I had a really good uh, spiritual practice anyway. I do Kriya Yoga. And so the only thing I added when I started my cancer program was gratitude. And uh, there, you know, Joe Dispenza talks about this a lot, that gratitude is what opens the, the blockage between your brain and your body. Right. Your brain can have all these positive thoughts and say these things are going to happen, but the body doesn't believe it uh, until you really practice gratitude. Then, every, then the body just falls in line so with your thoughts. Mm-hmm. So, and so I added gratitude to my meditation. Every day I just woke up. And I woke up so excited every day. Here I have cancer, right? And, I, and I'm not following any therapy. And I decided to do a program on my own. And, but every day I woke up so excited that my cancer was gone. And I was just waiting for it to show up. So I would sit down. i just do my little gratitude about thank you for getting rid of my cancer. I can't wait for it to show up. i do my spiritual practice, go down and get into my ketogenic diet get into my herbs and all the different program I had set up. And it was so exciting to me. I, I literally fell in love with the process of the ketogenic diet, getting high ketones, regulating my sugar. I had never done this before. And it was pretty new back in 2016. I was just going to ask you about that. So were you following the actual, because most people screw up the ketogenic diet. They eat too much protein, as you know. But were you actually following the correct, you know, 87%, you know, I only did, I only ate a protein food twice a day and it was 25 grams. There you go. Perfect. So and you did it right. Whereas most yeah, one of them was usually eggs and the other one was sardines. And I never ate sardines before. My wife liked them, but I never ate them. But I realized a can of sardines is exactly 25 grams of protein. It's yeah. So what the, what the corona, and then I just ate one. Right. Did you get, did you get your ketogenic information from Dr. Uh, August Dominic Augustino from up on his website, not a lot, but he had a site that just showed you foods. Yeah. And the content of the foods. Yeah. And then I had a friend who actually had put his brain cancer into remission. He had been in remission for three years at that point, and he was only supposed to live three months. And he sent me some strips and a little, uh, and told me where to get a meter and, explained it to me and i was off and going that's awesome i bought some oh you're gonna laugh i bought some mct oil and it turns out um i was using the 
cheapest, worst MCT oil sold in America, right? It was only 50% MCTs. Right. We only 5 or 6% C8. And, but that's what I used. And I got into ketosis within two days. And it was just normal for me to have ketones of about five, five point something. And blood sugar was always under 70. And I just, every day I just did the same thing. I did my bulletproof I made out of butter and stuff. And I followed the diet and I didn't eat till noon and, and that, and quit eating at five or six. And I just was in radical ketosis all the time. And you, you, um, so previous to that, you were still eating a vegetarian diet. Uh, I was eating more of a pescatarian diet. Pescatarian, okay. So fish and and veggies. And like, what was your normal like day? Just again, because the audience will ask this. Like, what did your diet normally consist of from like a carbohydrate store? Was it just vegetables and oh, fish? Carbohydrates was quinoa, some rice. Um, I was I had been gluten free then for years before that. Yeah, and so. Most of my carbs were vegetables or a little bit of rice, a lot of quinoa. I liked quinoa. Yeah. Sometimes I'd eat, um, I didn't eat pasta. I never liked it that much. No, me neither. But I would eat some of these pastas made out of beans. Um, I would eat cheese, eggs, fish. I wasn't against eating meat. I didn't like it that much. But if I went to a friend's house and they were barbecuing lamb, I'd eat it. Always made me feel great. And, uh, but, you know, that was basically my diet. It was a very healthy diet. What kind of fish? Just salmon? Salmon or cod. It always yeah. had to be wild caught. Right. Uh, Alaskan cod or Alaskan salmon. Uh, that was most of the fish that I ate. I never ate shellfish. I didn't like shrimp. Didn't like right. these different things. And started eating sardines once I got cancer. And I stuck to that because I knew the amount of protein. I didn't yeah. want to Yes, I wanted to be exact. Yeah. So you were you were eating in addition to just being fully ketogenic, you were also eating kind of um, the polyphasic, you know, um, what do you call it, circadian rhythm diet, where you're eat sun up and sun down. There's no food, you know. If if more people even just did that, regardless of the quality of their not quality, but the content of their calories, they would, you know, be less inflamed. Um, but very few people can do that, you know. Obviously, I'm a huge big, big intermittent fasting uh, proponent and trace ketosis guy. But if people just follow that, where they only ate, you know, when the sun was up and stopped eating when the sun went down, that, uh, the metabolic in, inflammation issues that people would have would go away. Because you're not designed to have 1,500 calories in your body at night while you're an hour and a half from sleep. No, no. You know, that's that's the thing. I still eat a ketogenic diet, although I'm not strict. Right. You know, I've added some uh keto i've added some uh quinoa back into it sure, sure. Lot. i eat a little bit of rice with certain dishes and i will um you know i vary it a little bit but i pretty much stick to the whole schedule of only eating between about noon and six o'clock that's genius yeah you know, and and you know but that whole process where i it was so exciting to me to realize i could regulate my sugar Right. And this is the main thing. This is what I think is one of the greatest things of the ketogenic diet, especially when you have cancer. Not only that it's, you know, the theory is you shut off the supply of, you know, food and oxygen and everything to your cancer cells. But the whole, the best thing about it for me was that cancer is a disease of a loss of control. You have no control now over anything that's going on because something's inside you that could kill you and you can't really feel it on a moment to moment basis. So you don't know if it's better today or worse today. You don't know where it's going. So you have no control over everything. But once you start to regulate your sugar and you figure out, I eat this, my sugar's this, I drink this, my ketones are this, I do, and all of a sudden you have total control over something. So there's something in your life you have control over. And now you're, and you just, I got so excited about it. It was so much fun. Literally, it was, to me, it was just fun. And then I got into this herb program. I, you're probably aware of Green Med Info. Oh, yeah. I got on Green Med Info and they had actually had a book on bladder cancer that you could download. And so it had like 50 different things that had been used in little clinical studies for bladder cancer. 
So just using my intuition, I picked out eight or nine of them and just started doing them three times a day. And, you know, it's stuff that no one would ever consider for cancer. I was taking ginkgo. Ginkgo was part of my cancer program. Who takes ginkgo for cancer? <laughs> but it's an amazing anti-inflammatory. And the whole theory was control the inflammatory markers that cause cancer replication. And so I had this, you know, I took some stuff that everybody knows, you know, like curcumin and green sure. tea and sure. stuff like that. But a lot of things you would never consider, you know, like pomegranate. And I was taking, you know, uh, milk thistle and these different things for cancer. And my whole program was just laid out three times a day. I did it and like clockwork and I would be reading and studying about it all the time, which got me really excited to do research. And I fell in love with it. Yeah. I mean, the truth is, Roger, and, you know, I don't want to make a diatribe because I want you to you know, talk a little bit more about especially the microbiome of the soul. Um, most people are so ignorant. And, and by the way, this is actually the medical community, too, of nutrition that the, the the ideology of literally, again, in a physical body, because we know it's all spiritual, really, from an energy body, but from a physical body ideology, it's the microbiome, right? Yeah. Like everything starts there, everything. And people eat so poorly, so unhealthily, they're so inflamed. And look, you know, to not make excuses for them or give them credit, but you and I both know, dude, like the United States now, it's a full scale, frontal, full body uh, full metal jacket assault, <laughs> the food, the air, the water. I mean, the plastics. I mean, you cannot avoid being attacked at this stage in this war. And so it's like, if you're not, you or me are super anal retentive and proactive and like what you put into your body. I mean, it's, it's hard. Right. Yeah. And so most people, I mean, dude, I get emails now. I see stuff that blows my mind. You know, they have SIBO and they have like, horrific dysbiosis of the microbiome and it's like if they just made better choices and again i'm not yeah. judging but better choices of like what they put in the gullet you will many people would be able to cure their cancers because as you know dude like they're literally feeding the cancer cancer is an ontological mutation of the cell and it's fed by sugar it's fed by acidic yeah. substance and so if you change the alkalinity of the biological system functioning, which again, starts with all the things that you're taking, you know, cleansing up your diet, living insulin controlled. I mean, I could go on and on. I don't want a rabbit hole, but most people don't do that. And as you know, they just do what the doctor says. And the doctor says, we got to start you on chemo right away. And they don't even address their nutritional issues. Yeah. I mean, they don't even know how to. Yeah. You know, sometimes I have this, I, I honestly believe this, that, if you're eating total junk, as long as you switch to a diet that has no junk in it and it's all whole foods, your body takes off like a car that's not totally had any gas. It's absolutely it's, it's true. like the entire thing changes. You look at type 2 diabetes, everybody thinks it's a disease. I don't think it is. I think it's your body reacting, reacting. exactly the way it should to what you put in it. That's 100% true. change what you put in it, it reacts a different way. You think you got rid of a disease? No, your body just started functioning the way it should on what you put in it. That's 100% true. I mean, I've been talking about living insulin controlled way back before even people even knew what insulin controlled was. You know, we talk about different supplements, medications, you know, um, uh, dihydroberberin, metformin. I mean, all of these amazing supplements that suppress blood sugar. But as you know, and you just said it, it's not a cure-all or an easy button to medicate your shitty lifestyle that you continue to eat garbage foodstuffs, GMO foods, you know, out of a box. I mean, look, two things, and then I want you to talk about the microbiome and soul. If human beings stop eating for 30 days, anything that came out of a box, just that, just that one step, and then number two, and both of these are equally as important and synergistic, Roger, they stop eating any kind of carbohydrate food, not green vegetables. That doesn't count. But any carbohydrate food at 6 p.m. And they did both of these things for 30 days. The benefit that they would see to their body composition and to their level of inflammation would be so profound that they wouldn't even be able to believe it. Because as you just said, and as you know, the stuff that they put into their gullet four to six times a day that they eat, and some people are, you know, are heavier eating more than that, is so inflammatory. 
that the body is literally screaming at them to stop. And as you know, the reaction of the body eventually is like cancer, type 2 diabetes, type 3 diabetes, which is Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative disease. So, I mean, it's very simple to do those two things. But, I mean, how many people can even do that for 30 days? No, you know, 10 years ago or so, I, I used to always say this at one of my lectures. If you just for a week decided to eat 10 servings of vegetables a day. That's true. Do it and see what happens to you in seven days. I'm blowing. Almost everybody lost five pounds and yep. they had twice as much energy. Yeah. Yeah. It turns out almost everybody eats one or two and that's it. Do, uh, Sal Stefano and I from, you know, from Mind Pump, you, you should, I should connect you with those guys. They should bring you on and talk about the story too. But, uh, you know, he has a story where he says, I don't even, you know, you guys are even more extreme, but he's like, I just tell people like, if you don't eat any boxed food for 30 days, like, I don't even care what your calorie counts are, right? Like if you just eat God created source driven or derived food for 30 days, I don't even care the amounts you eat and I don't care what your weight is. Watch what happens. And he's like, I've done that with thousands of people that I've consulted with both directly and indirectly in my 15 to 20 years in this business. And not one person has ever complained of it. It's true. So it's, it's what you right. just said. It's, it's God derived source driven, pure energy versus man created crap. Yeah. You know, when I was on the ketogenic diet, the version of it that I was, that I used to cure my cancer, I never counted my calories at all. The only thing I counted was to make sure that I only ate 25 grams of protein right. at one time, twice a day, and that I ate an avocado or two every day, and I ate fat whenever I wanted to, and I ate a lot of green vegetables. Just that, a lot of green that's vegetables. The problem. So the problem is, and you see, you're, I'm glad this is such a profound podcast. Most people, and this, this by the way, strips over into carnivore diet too now, because we're right. only talking the same thing. Most people overconsume protein. And the fallacy is that they can eat all the meat that they want, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> and that is not possible because of the energy demand of the fat and protein combined. Now, again, when you're breaking down, we're, we're talking Krebs cycle, we're geeking out right now. But when you're breaking down protein, it's the most inefficient um, macronutrient to break down. Fat will break down second. Carbohydrate breaks down the easiest. But the problem is, is when you eat protein with ample amounts of carbs and fats together, the body cannot break down protein until last. And so it will figure out between, you know, uh, fats and carbides, what's it going to break first? Well, it'll go first for fat because it's most nutrient dense, but then it will shuttle the carbohydrates and the insulin it produces into fat cells. And then the protein is left up there and it doesn't know what to do with it by the time it gets to the protein. And then there, as you know, in certain people, especially people on carnivore diets, it derives sugar. Yeah, protein, gluconeogenesis, and now we have fat. And so you, you're, you're. I mean, I'm sorry, you get fat deposition, and so you got all these people that will go on the carnivore diet for like a month and be like, it's amazing, and in the second month they put on 20 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I find this with the ketogenic diet. Most people that go on it have no clue what it actually is. Yep, they just think that they just eat more fat. And so they're just eating all kinds of terrible fat. And now, now they're damaging their arteries because yeah. they never quit eating sugar. That's so true. the body can't clear the sugar out. Now you have all this fat and sugar in your system and you're in trouble. You know, that's the worst thing for your arteries there is. And so, you know, but most people don't look deeply into something to no. figure out what it is before they get into it. And plus, you, you said in the beginning, the media, the me, as you said at the beginning of this podcast, the media confuses them. The marketing confuses people. I mean, most people are so broken at this point right now, like on today, yeah. about nutrition, because there's so many dissenting voices online. Right. You know, keto, carnivore, you know, if it fits your macros, Mediterranean, low carb. I mean, it's insane, but it's it literally is very simple. And I, and I say this, it's metabolically remaining metabolically flexible, fueling your body relative to your energetic demand. If you're a triathlete, you're going to need more carbohydrates than a bodybuilder. I mean, uh, um, than a normal person who's sedentary, a bodybuilder is going to need more carbohydrates than a person who's an endurance athlete who can run on ketones. So it's like, it's recognition of what yeah. will work for you. And then functioning what you're doing right now, which is like, 
part intermittent fasting, part trace ketones. That's a lifestyle that you can maintain forever. But people go hardcore, as you know, down one path. And then after two months or six weeks, the path starts to erode because they don't have the full awareness of what they're actually doing. Yeah, you know, I I just had that same experience a few months ago. I I have an injury that prevents me from squatting and doing different leg exercises. So I started riding a Peloton three times a week, but I do it very slow just to get my heart rate at a certain fat burning level. And I do it for a half hour, just three times a week. That's all I do. And it really helps my legs. But when I started doing it, there was a couple of times where I thought my heart was going to give out. I was so tired. I thought, oh my God, there's something wrong with me. And then it, it dawned on me. I'm on a pretty strict carbohydrate-free diet. I had a tablespoon of honey once before I went to the gym. I thought I could ride maybe 150 miles. <laughs> that's true though. And that's when the body becomes so metabolically efficient because you're not having carbs that in the presence yeah. of actual carbs, which is going to replete glycogen stores, you feel energized. Y'all, it was just mind-blowing, the difference between one day to the next riding by. Yeah, yeah. Lesson. But but that's important, though, Roger, what you're saying, because people do have to understand that, like, relative to your energetic demand, and I don't want to be geeking it up, whether you're riding a bike or lifting weights or hiking a mountain, you got to fuel the body relative to the energy that it's going to need to to perform the performance or to fuel the performance. Yeah, and so... And so I'm no longer on that strict, strict diet, but I have, you know, most people would consider my diet strict. I find it to be very liberal. Do you, you, know? do you still see a doctor and they give you the, oh, you're in remission or you don't even care? Oh, no, no, I never oh. see anybody. I haven't seen anybody for two years now. The guy, the guy was telling me after three years not to come back. That's he awesome. have to come back. He goes, That's amazing, dude, he that goes, he actually told you that. Yeah, he says, your bladder looks like the bladder of a newborn baby. That when it, when he went in for my second biopsy, which was right at three weeks after I, my intuition told me my cancer was gone, I got blissed out in my liver. Awesome. The city in my liver, it was kind of funny. I was actually talking to my friend with the brain cancer who turned me on to the ketogenic diet. Sure. sure. And I was sitting there talking to him, and all of a sudden I realized the entire room looks like it's got 1,000 watt bulbs in it. It is so bright in the light and I'm feeling so high. I just said, hey, John, I have to go. And I had, (laughs) right? And I walked out to the kitchen and I said, I looked at my wife and I said, who would have thought having cancer could be this much fun? And she looked at me and she goes, are you crazy? You could die. And I said, oh no, I've moved on for that. I'm done with it. And right then my sister calls me. And she goes, well, you're going in for a biopsy in three weeks. Are you scared? Are you worried? What do you think's going on? I said, oh, no, I'm done with it. I've moved on. She goes, what do you mean you moved on? I said, oh, I don't have cancer anymore. That's and, that, and that's it. That's it. The light bulb is, it's no longer a part of me. It's like, you know, in the in the spiritual community, they talk about burning a candle or burning a piece of paper and it's gone and you, you know, yeah. it's now removed from your energy field. That's literally how you have to do it. And then my sister hung up on me. And then, <laughs> so, so the next three weeks, and I was in that state of bliss for about four months. That's awesome. And so, um, I went, my wife had to take me to the hospital for my next biopsy to confirm that I didn't have cancer. And I hadn't said anything to my doctor and nobody, I hadn't even seen my doctor in three months. And so she's taking me to the hospital at 5 AM. Cause she's got to get the kids on the bus at six and <laughs> she's dropping me off. She goes, are you? Gosh, honey, are you worried? I wish I could come in with you. Oh no, I I feel great. I'm I'm good. Yeah, going in to to get a clean bill of health. And I walked in, and and I have to tell you, being in the hospital pre biopsy was one of the most fun experiences I've ever had in my life. I was so blissed out. I had every nurse in the whole wing laughing their butts off, and I was having so much fun. That's awesome. Twice my intuition told me. Roger, stop laughing and stop smiling because everybody's going to think you're on drugs. And then they won't give you any drugs when you come out. Yeah. And I just started laughing at that, right? But when the when the nurses would say, you know, it's so much fun visiting with you. What are you in here for? And I said, I am having a biopsy. I have stage three bladder. I had stage three bladder cancer. They got so depressed looking. That oh, no. Because they, whoa, most people just die. Yeah. yeah. And- 
I just got wheeled in and I was laughing as I went into the biopsy. And when my doctor woke me up, he goes, God, Roger, I don't know what to tell you, but it's gone. Find a thing. He goes, I could barely even tell or see the scar from where I burned your bladder the last time. Because you know, when they when they do the, the biopsy of stage three, the first one, they have to break your through the wall of your bladder. Sure. And they grab the tumors out of the fat and then they burn it so it goes back together. And it's quite painful for a couple of days to go to the bathroom. How, how, how big were the tumors that they grabbed? Because like, I would actually think that your mind may have just transmuted the tumors anyway. Well, it wasn't that they were so big. I never paid attention to that. But it's that they were almost to the edge of moving out of the fatty layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, so it was kind of funny. You know, I have a weird sense of humor. Yeah. I, was, I was sending people, friends of mine, pictures of my bladder because I thought it looked like Saturn. Yeah. I, and saying, God, did you see the planets last month? <laughs> and I was sending these pictures, and, and only one person said, that's not a planet. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so um, so he said, God, I can't even hardly see the scar. And then I went back in right before Christmas because he wanted me to do another bios- biopsy. Because I went and saw him three days later when he got the blood work back. He goes, you don't have cancer. You don't have anything. It's awesome. He goes, your bladder looked like the bladder of a newborn baby. I, did I you, just don't understand it. Did you kind of go like, yeah, I already know? Yeah, I told him I knew it was yeah. gone. Yeah. And then I did another biopsy in December, which again was one of the most fun things I ever experienced because I had, um, you know, I was still blissed out. Yeah. You know, and, and right before I went into the, to the, I had a male nurse that time who was taking me down from pre-op. And he says, you know, the doctor came in with a nurse and they go, is there anything you want us to know before you go in? Is, do you have any requests or anything? I says, yeah, because I was so high. I said, you know, the first time I had a biopsy, you stuck opium up my butt. And the, and the guy goes, and it was so amazing. And they just started laughing. They go, oh, the tray, opium. Because <laughs> they give you opium. I didn't know this, but they give you opium. Yeah. It shuts off your lower body. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't feel the pain of the burn of your life. I mean, I mean, people don't even realize that that's what they get addicted to. That drug is got opium. It's opium derived. Whatever that drug is, I'm thinking of what is, yeah. what is it called again? Uh, not Percocet. Is it Percocet? No, they just told me it was opium that they put up your butt. No, it, it's, it's, it's a drug, but it is opium as it's derivative or whatever. But that's what people get hooked on. So these people that go to these crazy retreats now that they do year round, you know, they, they've got these giant reset retreat, detox retreats. And then they give them ibogaine, which is the plant medicine that can, you know, end this, uh, what do you call it, uh, addiction to them. They're, all those drugs are, are opioid based. Yeah, It's crazy, dude. So I, so on the way down to surgery, my nurse and I were, we were talking about opening, opening a anal opium den in Las Vegas and how big it would be. Cause we're, I'm high and he's laughing his butt off. We came up awesome. all, and they wheel me into the surgery room and the anesthesiologist goes what the hell's wrong with you people we're doing a biopsy for cancer and i'm just laughing and that's awesome man yeah right and again the doctor goes god you have the bladder of a newborn baby and and he made me promise that i would get a biopsy twice a year and i just said okay so i could get out of there i never had another one Right. But every, every year I go back and he'd do a cystoscopy where he'd look at my bladder. And he goes, my God, he goes, I just can't even, this is just mind blowing to me. You know? And so after three years, he says, you don't have to come back. There's nothing going on. You're done. Yeah. You know? But I did the five year thing. That's amazing. I don't even think I would go back at all after I was cured just because I just, I'm su- I have such a distrust of allopathic medicine, but. Uh, you know, I think it was because I liked my doctor. So yeah. Actually the guy seemed amazing. Yeah. yeah, he had had cancer before, and you know he was on chemotherapy. He had bone cancer and, and survived it. And he was on chemotherapy, and he told me a story once of you're not even supposed to shave on the chemotherapy because you could nick yourself and bleed to death. Right? Dude, don't even get me on on chemotherapy. Yeah, so one day he goes, I I showed up for work and I put ketchup all over my top. <laughs> he goes in little spots. He goes, oh, I just cut myself shaving, and the whole office just freaked out. Yeah, he said it was. He was really quite. He just loved it. 
because he's a joker. He had a sense of humor. But that's awesome. But then you think of like how conditioned and brainwashed people are, dude. It's insane yeah. just because they all systematically just want. Oh. Okay, so before we end the show, which has been amazing, I want you to talk about the microbiome of the soul. Okay. Microbiome, as you know, in the health field is everything. You know, it's your internal, all your cells, but you have to realize that's just the beginning part that feeds the rest of your cells. Your, your cells emit light. They hold light. You have all these pathways into your body and your energy body. that are all about downloading light and putting light into your system. This is how you get in touch with the other layers of your soul. It's the amount of light that you're allowing into your system that lets you transcend things. So every cell in your body vibrates at a certain level of frequency. I, I think Deepak, Deepak Chopra said it once that when you're stressed out, even your toenails are stressed out. That's right. It affects every cell in your body. It's not just the tension you feel in your shoulders. So by eating well, eating food that your body likes, that it requires, that doesn't have to use its stored energy to combat something you put into it all the time, you're raising the vibration of every cell in your body and the frequency of every cell in your body and that they're able to hold more light and they're able to actually all be in a a synchronistic pattern of light. And so you have, you're putting yourself into a position to have an experience. So if you think of your food that way too, your meal is going to put you in a position to have a great experience, right? You think of it as just energy or you think of it as a spiritual experience. But everything that you do in life, no different than going to college and getting an education. It puts you in a position to have a different experience. Eating your food, meditation, it's all about bringing light into your body. You're all just creating an environment where you're putting yourself in a position to have an experience. And in my case, it was bliss. And in Other people, you know, all the meditation you do, all the prayer, all the gratitude, your food is part of it. It puts you in a position to have a different energetic experience. So every cell in your body is really a microbiome, part of the microbiome of your soul, because your body is just the physical vehicle your soul created to have this experience. And it's your job, which is what homeostasis of the soul is. Your job is to integrate all the layers of your soul so you can experience the full thing. And the full experience is bliss, experience of God. So everything starts with your, with your food, your thoughts, your prayers, your meditations, everything that you do. Roger, you're the man, dude. Let me put up your stuff here real quick. So your website, and I'll put your um, IG. So if somebody wants to connect with you further. I mean, I know they're going to reach out to you from this podcast and want to talk to you and stuff like that. Um, how, what is the best way for them to contact you? you obviously, you also have your IG. Um, you can get on Instagram and send me a message, which um, I probably check every three weeks if someone tells me. I hope you said every three days and you said three weeks. That's why I love you even more. And uh, But you can send me an email at rogerdrummer.com. It's just roger at rogerdrummer.com. Or my herb company, which is Herbworks, is just roger at Herbworks. So either way, you can get a hold of me. I get the email. Roger, uh, man, what, a, what a profound experience today. I'm so grateful and humbled and privileged that you did share um, your story. And uh, hopefully it will inspire and motivate other people, you know, especially just to not you know, get hook, line, and sinker caught up in the whole chemotherapy. This is the only option you have because, you know, we didn't even talk about that. I mean, I've talked about it so many times on the show, but I mean, people are literally damaging their aura even more by getting chemotherapy. Yeah, but you know, there's certain people are always going to have to go that route because of the fear issue. And yeah. sometimes it actually works, but the thing they have to remember is you still have to do the other stuff. Right. You know, that they scare you out of even eating better. They scare you out of taking an herb. Oh, that herb's terrible for you. It's toxic. God, they're pumping poison into your vein. I was about ready to say, do you, when you just say sometimes it works, yeah. are you programmed? Are we mental well, health? No, I've programmed that. <laughs> known some people that have done it and had good outcomes at yeah. least in the first five years or so. Sure. And, but normally it's because they've had a very, 
mild form of chaos. Yeah. And I, and I would also say too, along the lines of everything you just proved and I've experienced in my own life, if source has that as your calling and you survive it, then obviously there's a greater learning probably out the other side. That was the other thing I was going to say. It's your karma to survive it, no matter what therapy you decide to do. That's exactly right. It's yeah, exactly right. right. I remember somebody talking about a cancer support group, and they had somebody in the room that cured their cancer with carrot juice, and somebody in the room that cured it with chemotherapy. He goes, the reality is, who cares what you cured it with? <laughs> I mean, it's 100% true. I mean, your mind, and, you know, it, your the mind creates reality, our thoughts combined with our feelings, literally create and manifest exactly what we experience. But it's interesting because I, you know, that thing I shared with you earlier today, some of the newest research into the quantum is proving now that even though that statement, our mind does create reality with our thoughts is true, or it can be true. They're also now finding out too, that your reality to create a resonant reality, you also have to be living in a state of truth. And yeah. so it's interesting to see, right, that like if you're not living in a state of truth, your rot, your thoughts can actually create more of a distortion to right. the field of reality, which is fascinating to think about. Because like you know, the new age, which you and I are both you know heavily involved in, uh, likes to tell everybody that anybody can create reality with their thoughts, and they don't tell you that if you're terrified, as you said, or fear based. Or really just let's just you're under trauma based mind control, which many are, you're you gotta be careful. You, you really have to almost guard your thoughts. You know, it's like it's like I said earlier about gratitude opening the pathway so that your That's body right. actually believes your thoughts. That's beautiful. The, uh, if you're not doing that, you got have all this fear, you're you're just having thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. You're literally pushing negative thoughts into the quantum. And as we know, what you put out is what is reflected back. Yes. Wow. Amazing, brother. Well, listen, man, I'm so grateful that you came on. So guys and gals, support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Go to Roger's website, rogerdrummer.com. You can also email him if you're looking to do a podcast with him or connect with him in any other way at roger at rogerdrummer.com. And you can follow him on IG, which is right here, roger-drummer or underscore drummer underscore homeostasis underscore soul. Follow him because he'll never respond to you. And remember... Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.